Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar on evolving leadership, why we need a new form of leadership for the 21st century. Uh, you're joining us in a sunny, sultry Cambridge and I hope that you're all well joining us from wherever you are. I think we've got 300 people joining this webinar from all around the country. So firstly, let me introduce our speakers today. So myself, I'm Zoe Arden, I'm a fellow here at CISL. I also lead on a lot of our leadership work and I'm the head tutor of our high impact leadership online course. So delighted to be chairing today's session and also delighted to introduce our two esteemed speakers here. So Dr. Louise Drake, who has got a very um, difficult, challenging job today of taking us through the leadership theory and to this point, who is um, an academic tutor and course director here at CISL. And welcome also to Manish Datta, who is a senior associate here at CISL and also head of membership and insights at the UK Green Building Council. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So here is a, an overview of our agenda for today. So we're actually going to be looking at the context of exploring leadership, the purpose of leadership, the nature of leadership that's required and the role of the individual. And Lou is going to take us through the kind of context and theory and Manish is going to provide some insights, personal insights from your career, which to sort of punctuate and um, give us a, a, a personal perspective on, on what Lou takes us through. And before I dig into today's webinar, also wanted to give you a quick sense of what next, so what you can look forward to in terms of, of what's coming. So our next webinar in this series will be on September the 12th, looking at purposeful leadership. We have the next cohort of our high impact leadership short course, online course, kicking off on July 31st. And Lou and I will be leading alongside Victoria, Dr. Victoria Hearth, our next leadership lab on October 15th, 16th. So we'll, we'll share those again at the end, but just to give you a sense of what else is coming out from us. So firstly, Lou, thank you for doing all the hard work in terms of condensing about 100 years of leadership theory and sharing it with us over the next 30 minutes so kicking us off um lou can you just get us started on what we mean by leadership theory well thank you zoe and it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon by leadership theory i mean the way in which we make sense of leadership our mental model of leadership and that actually has it's an academic field of study, but it has real practical outworkings in terms of what we look for in leaders and how we develop leaders, you know, whether we see history as the result of great men and their natural attributes, whether we see it as the importance of context or whether we think about the role of followers and um, why they follow and, 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 the, and the characteristics of followers. Great. Now, I know that you're going to share three specific trends with us. That's right. This morning. And, and as you say, the literature is vast and so I've been highly selective uh, but the first trend um, we're going to think about the purpose of leadership and emerging thinking on that the second trend about the nature of leadership and what theory has to say about the nature of leadership um, and then thirdly thinking about what does that mean for individuals um, and their own leadership development great super Great, so can you kick us off? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so we're thinking about evolving leadership, leadership for the 21st century. So I'd love to start mm. off with a quick reflection on the importance of context. Mm. So um, a number of leadership theories recognize the importance of context and the contingent school of leadership, um, look, looking at how different situations require different types of leader, the situational school of leadership, looking at how leaders adapt their style to be effective in different situations. Now, in those early leadership theories, um, context is seen primarily in terms of team or organization. In today's context, context, our idea of context needs to be bigger. We're in such a, a globally connected um, world. So I like the idea of understanding context as understanding the times. Yeah. Um, um, to use this uh, quote here. So the times profoundly influence what it takes to be a successful leader. Yeah. So how would you characterize our times? Mm. Well, some people talk about them being VUCA, it's a familiar term to many of us, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Um, I've mentioned 
hyper-connectivity, hyper-mobility, although others have drawn attention to different forms of isolation and fragmentation. Community looks a lot different now to what it did um, a few generations ago. Um, if we looked at the World Economic Forum Global Risk Register, um, we'd start to think about things like climate instability, um, cyber and security. Uh, I think this quote from um, CISL's report last year um, captures it quite well. The world is experiencing a, um, a fourth industrial revolution characterized by unprecedented changes driven by new technologies. At the same time, there are these pressing social and environmental challenges from climate change to wealth inequality, which pose these fundamental risks for the stability and well-being of our society. Now, the challenges that are mentioned there we might call system challenges um, they're not isolated issues they are expressions of this system this hardwired system that reflects certain um, norms and values and has institutions and and rules of the game we could have a very lengthy debate about what those rules and values are but um, this is the conclusion of um, a report from last year um, based on a growth fixation and flawed philosophy, we've created an economy to maximise financial and built capital, and in doing this, destroyed our life support uh, systems. Without them, there is no social stability, no life, no economy. Wow. Well, that's a very <laughs> profound place to start, Lou. So, given that's the context, given that's the description of the times we're in, what does that mean for leadership? Well, I think an increasing number of commentators now are recognising that leadership can't be success within this system, um, success within a system that's fixated on growth, um, as if that's a fixed reality. Um, this quote, I think, highlights it well. Um, we have this incredible power to transform our environment, and yet we have this odd tendency to throw up our hands and proclaim our inability to change the system. Um, I think leadership for today needs to recognise this power and not simply seek to adapt and be successful within the system, but actually to try and adapt the system, to try and transform the system in order to achieve long-term well-being for all. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that this is something that both individual leaders, whether they're aspiring or existing leaders, and also people in learning and development mm -hmm. and HR functions are particularly focused on, both from the report that we've referenced already today and also with regard to the report that we did recently on equipping leaders for long-term yes. um, business yes. success. So one of the areas that, that we've seen emerge is this whole area of purpose that's become really popular now. It, yes, absolutely. And as you say, there's been this explosion of interest in purpose, largely in the practitioner field, but I think academia is catching up and indeed it's the focus for our next webinar um, mm -hmm. in the series. Yeah. Um, I think what's very, um, what's particularly relevant about purpose for this discussion is when we look at purpose in the context of knowing the times, um, that brings us into the, um, the interesting realm of impact. Um, so truly impactful leadership will no longer be contented with any sort of purpose, even if it's quite a noble purpose, it will be seeking to really confront and face up to the most pressing challenges facing humanity and actually want to really try and transform the system in order to achieve that long-term well-being for all. Great, okay. And we've mentioned leadership and impact in the same sentence there, so <laughs> clearly that leads me on to ask, you know, how does that relate to the Cambridge impact leadership model? That's right, and that was the one that was published yeah. last year. So if, if the goal of our leadership is to uh, achieve positive and social environmental outcomes, um, in a business context, that means rethinking commercial success and business performance so that it actually aligns with those outcomes. The challenge is that the rules of the game, the economy, often kind of hinder that alignment. And so bold leadership is needed to transform that economy, to rewire the economy. That's a phrase that we've used in a, um, our 2017 report. Um, so that business aren't a hindrance to um, well-being for all but actually a key means of achieving um, that ultimate outcome yeah yeah fantastic so so that's effectively our first trend yeah and that gives us a much more inspiring business purpose mm. actually to be part of that transformation of the economy yeah brilliant 
So we're bringing together insights about purpose and knowing our times um, and thinking about how future leadership is about ambitious transformation of the system itself for the better well-being of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, so that's very much our trend one, the purpose of leadership and driving systems transformation. Mm -hmm. So what does uh, leadership theory have to say about the nature, the kind of leadership that is required to drive that change? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? I'm happy to. I don't know if we nash had any um, reflections on the um, that, that first yeah. trend at all. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, uh, Lou. And uh, delighted to be here and join you. Uh, and um, I suppose I want to just sort of rewind slightly and think about who was the first corporate leader that had that sort of purpose-led impression on me. And I remember uh, being a sort of leading construction programs for Marks and Spencer about 15 years ago, being invited by one of our suppliers, a flooring company, Interface, to a lunch with their CEO, uh, Ray Anderson. Now, I didn't know a great deal about Ray Anderson. I did do some homework, knew that he was into something called sustainability, didn't really know what that was. Um, but I was so struck um, by, more than anything else, his radical views on things. Um, you know, it's not your normal supplier client lunch, this. Um, and, you know, he's since been known uh, for um, expressing, uh, re expressing the purpose of interface uh, and the purpose of business from moving from an extractive sort of model of operation to a regenerative model of operation called sort of mission zero in interface language. But at that time, probably about 10 years ahead of most of, uh, of his peers, he, he definitely was seeing some of the, the, the times. He was, you know, perhaps projecting where the times were going to lead us. Um, and, you know, then he's become famous and he did use that lunch, things like, you know, in future people like me will go to jail and there's no business case for a dead planet. He's become famous for those. But it was, he, beca he became for me that moment where I started thinking about this topic because he, he clearly had had a change in his purpose as a leader and therefore changed the purpose of Interface uh, forevermore and they continue to do so today and be recognised as such. And then if I just sort of translate that probably two or three years later, two things were happening to me in my personal and professional life. So in my personal life, I was going to become a father and that had a profound impact on my outlook. You know, it completely changed my outlook. It changed the way I measured time from you know, just thinking about time from my eyes, but actually starting to think time multi-generationally because I was about to become a father of the next generation, I guess. And, and firstly, when I had this baby in my hands, my son Yash, it took me back uh, to the time when I was his age. You know, I, I was very fortunate to be brought up in, in Kenya. All of my childhood was either in the Indian Ocean looking at the beauty of, of the sea or actually in gay reserves looking at the, the beautiful nature around me. And I'd very much taken that for granted until that moment when I realised actually in the 30 years that or so that had passed, so much had changed. And then I fast forwarded 30 years further, thinking, well, what's the world going to be like when Yash is my age? Mm -hmm. And actually that completely struck great fear in me. And, and I recall then the words that I'd heard from Ray Anderson. Mm -hmm. And around that time, uh, very fortunate for me in my professional life, so my personal purpose was being awakened, I guess, in my professional life, Marks and Spencer launched Plan A, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. But that may, meant that it was a really easy fit for me. It didn't mean that I was getting it right and successful at it, but it meant that so suddenly, you know, this future um, thinking that I had in my mind about what's for purpose, you know, my purpose had changed, my outlook had changed, and m and gave me an opportunity to try and fulfil that through professional action, which which was fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you, Munish. Two great examples, like professional milestone and also a, a personal milestone, which um, that's really, really helpful. So, Lou, given that and um, given those sort of insights from Nish, tell me a little bit about what's the leadership that's required to drive this, this systems mm. level change. Mm. And I think there has been a noticeable shift in leadership theory over the last um, few decades, um, particularly away from this idea of heroic individuals and moving towards thinking about collective capacity for change. Mm. Um, so if I expand that a little bit further, um, you might be familiar with the idea of the great man um, mm. theory of leadership um, came to prominence in the 19th century um, and saw history um, and, and change largely in the light of these significant chaps and men um, and their natural attributes, whether that's their intellect or their powers of persuasion or their courage. Um, now that 
field of um, or that theory spawned um, a field of leadership studies um, around traits and trying to identify um, the qualities that were unique to leaders and that all good leaders possess to some extent. Um, and trait theory is alive and kicking today. Uh, uh, but but it's, it's been met with a number of criticisms. Um, it, it doesn't acknowledge the role of context, that's where the contingent and situational schools that I mentioned previously sort of bubbled up to address that, um, and it doesn't pay much attention to the role of followers and who they are and um, why they choose to follow. Um, and so a sort of more contemporary take on um, heroic um, models of leadership um, would be theories that um, do pay attention to the role of followers, um, and start to explore how leaders can inspire um, and encourage a community to rise up and tackle um, a shared goal, which is what we might um, call transformational theories of leadership. Okay, so communities, inspiring people, fellowship, so transformational leadership sounds like it's got some good things going for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Yes and no. Um, so um, transformational and a related field, charismatic field, um, theories of leadership remain the most popular um, um, research um, areas of focus. And um, there are more publications on those schools of leadership than any other type of leadership. Um, and they're, they're trying to make sense of how some individuals seem to have this potent impact on history, um, perhaps because of their charisma um, or perhaps because of some other attributes. So a very classic definition of leadership um, using the quote on the screen is that of Burns and um, the idea that it's a relationship of mutual stimulation um, where leaders and followers raise one another to higher levels levels of motivation and morality. So as you said, leadership becomes about engaging and inspiring and galvanizing a community to face shared challenges um, or um, see shared opportunities. Well, that sounds pretty good, <laughs> but you implied at the start of your answer that there were um, some issues with transformational leadership as well. Do you want to explain a little bit more about that? It's quite a broad church, yeah. um, and certainly some transformational leadership theories are still very leader-centric, right. um, and so they might focus on what makes that leader so effective. Is it their, their wit, or their moral persuasion, or their character, or their convictions? Um, and so there's this very strong mental model still of the hero. Um, and, and it is a very powerful mental model. I think, if we're mm -hmm. honest, if, you know, when we think of society, I think it's the mental model that most people have. Someone says leadership, we think leader, um, whether that's Paul Pullman or Donald Trump or Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, please, please don't mishear me. It's, um, what I'm not saying is that there are no great men or women who have changed the course of history or will continue to do so. That's not what I'm saying. But if we if we see leadership purely or even largely in those terms, then we're going to actually have really quite a limited picture of how change happens. Um, I miss out on some important dimensions. Um, scholars talk about the romance of leadership where followers over attribute the group's success to um, their leader. And so we neglect the importance of context or serendipity um, or luck um, um, or indeed the role that followers play and that actually is an interesting area that that idea of followership it's a growing mm. field of study yeah and followership it's become a little it's a little bit like purpose isn't it it's become mm -hmm. very in vogue recently mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit more about followership sure sure um so followership recognizes that leadership is inherently about relationships um, and that leadership only happens when there is following and leading and i think this quote captures it well it is in following that leadership is created. Um, and, and there are a number of interesting ideas around followership. Um, people might have heard of the idea of the first follower, the courageous follower, um, who vigorously supports leaders. And we also can see how um, followers can shape leaders' behavior, either by being resistant or being very proactive. Um, now, some theorists have pushed that um, a bit further and said that actually let's separate the idea of leadership from leaders and um, it, it's it's more helpful to understand leadership as a process that is the result of the combined actions of um, of leading and following and um, that would be a constructionist approach to leadership um, and i would argue it's the interactions between people 
create or construct the leadership. So leadership isn't about a leader, leadership is something that the group shows. Um, and, and in fact, pushing this even further, if there is a leader, actually that leader is a purpose, a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so to uh, quote what's on the screen there, leadership um, in which the common purpose rather than the any particular individual is the invisible leader um, that inspires leaders and followers to take action on its behalf. Okay. It's all getting a little bit abstract. <laughs> so what um, what practical differences do these insights make? Sure. And what does it mean for the people? Yeah. Man yeah. and woman on the street. Yeah. Well, the way in which we understand leadership, the mental model that we have of leadership, absolutely shapes, shapes what we're looking for in leaders and how we develop them. Mm. So if we have a mental model of the hero leader, our leadership development will be about trying to find the next hero, thinking about the traits they need, looking to develop those traits. Um, if leadership is actually about understanding the importance of context, then we will give um, leaders a, a deep immersion into understanding the world and how they can adapt to it and, um, and, you know, and understand the times. Um, if we understand leadership as the interactions within a community, well, that starts to get us thinking that <coughs> leadership can flow in all directions. Leadership can take place at any level of an organization. That followership is as important um, as leadership. And that actually exploring and trying to um, agree on a shared purpose is, is crucial. Um, and at a very basic level, what that means is that everybody has a role to play in leadership. Mm. I just, I really like this quote. Mm. Um, it's a number of years old now, but I, it remains as relevant today by um, the systems thinker, um, Danella Meadows, and um, in relation to the idea of the sustainability revolution, the change mm. um, we, we want to see happening. If it happens, it will be organic and evolutionary. It will arise from the visions, insights, experiments, and actions of billions of people. That, that's that's super. Thanks, Lou. So that effectively is our second trend. So we're moving from the heroic leader to this idea of sort of the collective mm -hmm. creating change. Manish, from billions of people to <laughs> one individual in this room. Wow, right. What, what, what insights have you got that you could share on this? Thanks, Zoe. So, so I want to go back to the launch of Plan A, Marks and Spencer Sustainability Programme in 2007. Um, and yes, the, the, there was a heroic leader, I guess, at the start of that, which was the CEO, Stuart Rose, um, who sort of uh, came across the film Inconvenient Truth. But actually, what many people don't know is how systemic and how sort of co-created and quite democratic the change then happened, became at Marks and Spencer um, and how it became a sense of commun communal change as opposed to Stuart. So Stuart definitely gave it the, the right sort of launch pad, but he, he then gathered uh, to start off with his hundred strong leadership team, took them to a cinema, showed them the film and actually got up at the end and said, you've got a few weeks to come up with a plan, a plan that, you know, is, is for every part of our business, every part of our value chain. It's not just a plan for one part, but all of it. And in, in doing so, a, mobilizing them and getting them to co-create this plan, but also making sure it was all encompassing. Mm. It was quite, it became a plan that was relevant to everyone, which was very powerful, I thought, at that time. Mm. And just to bring some context to that time in Marks and Spencer's history, it wasn't like, you know, the, the, the glory days where these things were easy to launch. This was a really difficult time and just uh, fended off a very hostile takeover bit. Its share price wasn't where it wanted it to be. The profits were not where it wanted it to be. So this was very audacious. This was quite, quite a courageous move. Um, but we did launch it. And what then ensued was how this plan created by now 100 people had then became sort of weaved into the fabric of the organization, right from directors to heads of function and right down to sort of people in shops and sales advisors, colleagues that were sales advisors in shops, where each of them, because of this very sort of comprehensive nature of it, were able to relate to their part of plan A. So at a shop assistant level, they were able to relate to the fact that, you know, if they became more energy efficient, it would enable A, to reduce carbon emissions, but also as an incentive would enable them to earn more bonus, as an example. And there's nothing that works better in a retail setting than chasing down targets and, you know, having having incentives like that. It was very, very effective in that respect. And I, th I think for me, when you know a movement, and I, I do deliberately describe Plan A as a movement that becomes successful, is when 
it becomes a verb in the language of the people that are in it. That's when you know it's not about one leader, it's about pe every person owning that change and being a champion of that change. And, you know, in the terms that were used earlier, being sort of the, follow the followers of, of this movement. Um, and it's when, you know, I was at a printer and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, that's not very plan A, is it? And I had to stop and ponder, well, what does that mean? Actually, this program, uh, which had 100 targets underneath it, had turned from a program into a way of behavior. It turned into a verb. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when you know that you've really, really, and, and then you'd hear it all the time in meetings and in corridors and, you know, it's sometimes very seriously and sometimes quite jovially and you knew that you'd been in a movement. And of course, MNS have taken that further uh, and have now started mobilizing whole communities. Um, so I remember when we launched beach cleans in uh, across 200 different beaches across the UK, that took this concept and brought it to the customer and involved customers and supply chain nearby to actually go and clean beaches, join in this plan A cause. Really, really powerful stuff. It really drives loyalty. And of course, there have been other examples outside of Marks and Spencer recently where this sort of followership model of leadership is emerging. So if you think about, again, a slightly atypical leader, uh, Greta Thunberg, but then the, the kind of leadership that that has created at, at very you know, over 100 locations around the world every time there's this sort of protest that happens among school kids that requires its own sort of followership based leadership right around the globe which is really powerful and then one last example i'd like to give to a complete in a completely different way which is i was watching um, the bbc documentary dynasties and i think there's a lot that we can there's a lot of leadership lessons that we can learn from the, from the animal kingdom and nature itself and whether it's a pride of lions and how leadership evolves in a pride of lions or a group of apes, et cetera, et cetera, I think there's some very powerful stuff in there that, again, can teach us a lot. So three quite different examples. Brilliant. Thank you, Manish. Those are super examples. So we've gone from the heroic leader to this sort of collective thought of leadership. And taking us back to the fact that on this webinar, we've got about 300 individuals. We'll have many more that watch the recording afterwards, and there'll be as we said, aspiring or existing leaders, or they'll be in L&D, HR roles. Lou, take us back to what's the role of the individual in all of this? Well, individuals absolutely have a role to play, and, um, and a, collective a collective understanding of leadership doesn't minimise the role of the individual. What it means is that it frees up individuals, arguably, to be their authentic self, to play to their strengths, um, and to have a unique um, contribution to play. And, and that, of course, has significant implications for leadership development. So perhaps traditionally, um, some organisations have used competency frameworks um, based on the behavioural school of leadership. Um, they would identify a set of leadership competencies for certain roles within the organisation and, and then help leaders develop um, those patterns of behaviour. Um, now contrast that um, with the idea of authenticity, um, which would argue is crucial when operating in this, um, this, this interconnected world where organisations actually function more as communities. And so leadership development becomes more about helping individuals grow who they are um, rather than conform to any sort of standard, um, standard model. Interesting. So Manish. Does this idea of sort of the authentic leader, mm -hmm. does that resonate with you? Very much so. So let me pick an example, uh, take myself back to my place of birth, uh, Kenya, uh, and, and select a, a leader that's really inspired me uh, in so many ways. Unfortunately, I never met Mangari Mathai, but she was the first um, Nobel Prize winner, a uh, female Nobel, Nobel Prize winner from Africa, also the first woman in East Africa and Central Africa to earn a doctorate degree in 1971, which, given how society was in those days, is, is quite remarkable. But what uh, Bangari Mathai is particularly known for is the Green Belt Movement, which she created in 1977, and that spurned a whole um, wave and wave of action, which ultimately culminated in the, in the planting of 51 million trees. Mm -hmm. Uh, and counting um, of, of um, as, a, as the most effective, as we know from various studies more, more recently, but, uh, best way to sort of capture carbon from the atmosphere. And what's really powerful about this, about uh, Rangari Mathai, is, is if you listen to her and if you read what she's written, is the one thing that, well, the two things that come across, but one in particular is how authentic, how believable it all is, um, but also how humble it is. And I think those two things go really close together. You know, this, this, this concept that the leader has all the answers is, is not as believable as actually, 
you know, whether I'm launching a new sustainability plan or a new business line or whether I'm launching a movement, the Green Belt movement, I don't have all the answers. I am seeking them. You're going to help me solve those answers. And that, I think, feels very authentic because no, no one has all the answers. Uh, and that makes you believe in them particularly well. And it's a quote of hers. I'm very conscious of the fact that you can't do it alone. That really uh, sings to me. And she empowered thousands and thousands of women in East Africa in particular to find a sense of identity, a, a sense of individual, individualism, individualism, and also contribute much more, not just to planting trees, but actually to create some subsistence for themselves as well through the Green Belt movement. Um, and she created thousands and thousands of leaders as a result of that. Mm. So I, I think for me, you know, authenticity um, mixed with humility uh, mm. are really, mm. really important leadership traits. And that's, she, Wangari Mathai is, is a great example of that. Great, mm. lovely, thank you. Finish, that's super. So this this sense of authentic individual leaders for change, how is that um, coming through in the Cambridge Impact Leadership Framework? Lou? Um, absolutely, it's core to that and building on what Munish has shared. Um, it's the idea of having and building confidence mm. in the contribution that you can make that fits with your personality and your skill set and your inclinations, not trying to be someone that you're not. Um, and, and then also the other side of that, recognizing where you can use the leverage of others um, and the skill sets of others. Um, and so you're playing your part, but also recognizing the part that others are playing within that system. Right, brilliant. So can you give us some specific examples of that? The model? Yeah, well, I'm, I, I think building on one of the themes mm. that we've covered mm. earlier, and I think this is where the, the model takes us further. Mm. If leadership is about purpose more than it is about any one person, mm. um, that I think that still has implications for individuals because it, it emphasizes the importance of working through our own personal purpose in light of this compelling shared purpose um, for humanity. Um, and now, that's not a simple discussion to have with yourself or others, um, and it becomes even more complex when we start to weave organisational purpose into that discussion. You know, what happens when our individual values um, collide with our corporate values? Um, what happens if our organisation's purpose is not where we think it ought to be, given the challenges that we're facing as society? But, um, but having those discussions, um, the model would argue, is absolutely critical, because if we don't tap into personal purpose, then we are, we are failing to kind of harness um, the passion, the commitment, the creativity, you know, our music, to use um, um, the the idea in this yeah. quote here, um, and that remains locked inside, and um, rather than tapped into and and used to drive change. Great. So that's that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and then in terms of that, how that plays out mm. in the impact leadership model a little mm. bit more specifically, yeah. um, and these are an excerpt from the model. Um, this is about how we might nurture mm. values. And you'll notice that there aren't actually specific values identified mm. here. And what the model and the framework encourages individuals to do are to know themselves. So know what they stand for, their mm. principles and convictions, understand what inspires and give a sense of meaning. Um, and to do that whilst also kind of encouraging other worldviews and assumptions mm. to come to the surface and actually have constructive um, debate about what is moral, mm. what is responsible, mm. what is fair um, within, within the organisation. So less about specifying particular values and more about encouraging ongoing conversations mm. on these things. So that's super, not being prescriptive, mm -hmm. but giving people the space to explore what that looks like for themselves. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So Manish, perfect opportunity to bring you in mm. and get a sense of um, what that looks like for you. So late last year, I decided to take quite a, quite a big step in my life, which was after a very wonderful 21 year career at Marks and Spencer, I decided that I wanted to move from one great pioneering organization to actually using that experience to try and influence hundreds of organizations if I can. Um, and I decided to therefore join the UK Green Building Council, which is a, um, a, a organization that's mission is to radically make property more sustainable, works with 400 members across the entire property value chain, um, and also to work uh, increasingly with CRSL, with its many global clients, from heavy industry to FMCG to finance and many, many more, to try and see how I can 
really leverage this burning purpose inside me, not to try and affect change in a broader set of stakeholders. And that was really powerful. One of the other things that I also do is, is I'm a trustee of a small charity. Um, and not long ago, a few weeks back, I, was, uh, I took a group of um, volunteers who, who at their own expense, both in terms of time and funding, went out um, to help really disadvantaged communities through the charity in India for a period of 10 days. Um, and actually, uh, that was quite difficult for them as individuals. So I was not only experiencing what I was as a person, but viewing what others were going through with me, which is very powerful. And I, I think all these experiences um, have taught me one thing is if, if you can hit that jackpot of personal purpose when you've identified it and and I just want to add that that purpose certainly in my experience is not a static thing it's a thing that is dynamic it does change with time with things that happen in your life with the things that the things that are happening to you and are happening generally in society so my certainly my personal purpose 10 years ago is it was was at a different pace to the way it is now I, I now know having had the information that i've now got the education that i've now got that we we are in a in a situation where we don't have a great deal of time to do something about the sort of challenges we face so, so my purpose has changed but where where those two things align and you can do something professionally that meets that purpose then you've hit the jackpot and you can really as i think that the, the music can really play inside you using that example that you had earlier um, and there's a direct correlation in my opinion between those two things coming together and incremental effort productivity better peace of mind just greater motivation and and, and greater output by the individual i'm certainly finding that in my life as i i get through it fantastic so um thank you for that that's super so thank you both for that incredible canter through to both theory and what that means in person and, and Manish to you giving us those great super personal insights. So now it's time for questions and thank you for the questions that we had have come in in advance. I know that we've addressed some of those questions that came in advance through the, the course of the last 30 minutes um, but one question that came up actually sort of two versions of it which I'd, I'd like to address to you Manish if I may yeah. is so we had questions, how, do, how does a non-senior employee drive senior leaders towards sustainability-focused um, leadership? And, and, and this other side of the coin is collaboration is key, but how to align senior executives who may have different motivations? So we, we get this question a lot as well in the High Impact Leadership course. So be, be interested in your reflections on that. Um, so uh, I, I also I think the model of what's senior and what's not senior is changing all the time in business as well. And the more enlightened businesses are breaking down those kinds of titles yeah. and hierarchies quite yeah. quickly. But there are that, that that issue, whether you call it senior or not, does still exist in businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's about for me, it's always been about I suppose another word that I use for purpose, but from a sort of more tactical point of view, lever. Lever is a great word, and just understanding what are those levers or the purposes of those individuals that you can you can turn to try and uh, create uh, greater action from them to support your particular mission and then that's of course we're talking about sustainability where that's really important but it can be actually for any type of change you want to bring about um, and you know I've, I've realized that times for example that um, kilowatt hours carbon emissions um, biodiversity gain are not the levers sometimes that particularly excite certain sometimes senior colleagues mm -hmm. and you have to go in there with just understanding what are their levers what what is it is it cost saving in which case you know you position your message according to cost saving mm -hmm. is it revenue generation is it creating a better product is it creating uh, a product that is going to appeal to their customer a bit better and just trying to think of it in sort of business currency terms and not necessarily sometimes in environmental or social sustainability terms helps you sort of reach that purpose in them that that perhaps is harder to if you, you use the same language that you normally do great super and lou in terms of resources mm. that individuals can turn to i know that you mentioned the embedding project earlier yes yes so um there's an organization called the network for business sustainability they're based in south africa and they have um, undertaken a, a number of very helpful reviews and pulled together a number of resources on on this and other topics and um, they did a piece of research looking at what uh, drives and shapes ceo decision making um, and then from that distilled out um, key practical advice for people seeking to be change agents um, and, and that's part of a suite of resources called the embedding product um, an embedding project um, and 
those insights would in include um, the one that Munish has just mm -hmm. mentioned, um, but also things like um, being known for being absolutely committed to the business and a trustworthy mm -hmm. advisor on a whole range of issues so that when you come to kind of try and push for change on, on, on something to do with sustainability or a social issue, a societal issue, you've got some traction there. Um, having wisdom on the right window of opportunity um, and um, and when to bring things up, making sure they're not a pet project, but absolutely um, linked with the strategic objects of the company and um, playing into people's sense of wanting to have a good legacy um, within a company and beyond. Um, and I, I guess tapping into people's ego um, on, on that basis. So I, I found that a very useful resource. And I know that on the master's um, programme um, on which I um, and part of the team and um, that's been a very useful resource for a number of our um, change agents on that program. Super, now you mentioned the masters and one of the questions that we got in advance was um, around are business schools changing their curriculum to focus on um, new priorities and responsibilities towards sort of societal good, mm. what are your reflections on that? I think that there are some positive trends on this. I think, um, you know, some time ago we might have been looking at business and society as an elective module, or perhaps you had to do a very specific um, MBA program that was mm. absolutely targeted on one planet or something like that in order to get that sort of education. And I think we've seen a shift in that regard. Um, I think that. Um, so a study in 2002 um, called Beyond Grey Pinstripes um, found that. 72% I think of the top um, 100 MBA programmes now had core content on business and society. Now those figures are out of date, um, I imagine the picture is, is more positive than that now. Um, I think we're seeing um, a growing interest from students in wanting to grapple with mm. um, these issues. Mm. Um, one trend that's been observed is that there are a growing number of academics working on issues of business mm. and society, business and sustainability, who are then applying for the top jobs um, in business schools and so that they can therefore bring in that content not just into one module on business mm. and society but actually permeating um, the whole program and um, the, the note of caution that i would add is that um or the question i would want to ask is um in that course content are businesses and leaders really being encouraged to tackle the most pressing sustainability, so social, environmental issues that are uh, that are on the horizon. And um, are we being are we engaging with the data that mm. is out there about ecosystem decline and and rising inequality and taking that seriously and actually thinking about radical transformation or is it still a nice part of the curriculum, something that enhances corporate um, reputation and you can take it or leave it. So I think that will be the challenge there. Great to see it on the agenda. Mm. Are we actually taking it as seriously as we should be though in terms of the transformation that is needed. Absolutely, yeah. Can I make an observation as well from a sort of uh, delegate point of view? Uh, I'm a tutor on the online uh, business sustainability management course mm -hmm. here at CISL, which I thoroughly recommend. And, and if you look at the profile of people that come onto it, um, increasingly there are people with job titles that don't have any sort of sustainability mm -hmm. core functions in them. Um, and this is the big question, I think, whether it's for the UK Green Building Council or for CISL, is how do you mainstream this? How do you, make, how do you move it from being something that is the job of a couple of people, niche, quite specialist into, mm -hmm. actually this affects every part of the way you run your business mm -hmm. and its future. And I'm seeing some really positive signs through the kind of students that are coming through these programs, the kind of students that uh, I'm on faculty for, for some of the leadership programs that we do here at CISL with businesses, um, where actually it's no longer about sending a CSO to the course, mm -hmm. it's about sending a chief procurement officer or your mm -hmm. head of, um, uh, you know, head of sales to the course, mm -hmm. because these are becoming, from, from a business point of view, quite existential as topics. They're not about sustainability in the corner somewhere. Mm -hmm. Great, no, that's that's really useful additional insight. Thank you, Mish. So, Lou, we've had a, a question from the webinar. You mm. um, meant you quoted Amory Lovins mm. earlier, and we've had a question around sort of can you expand a little bit on the challenge, the challenging vision regarding the future? So the. The publication I quoted from was um, called A Final Future. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was Hunter, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, Hunter Lovings, and then three colleagues um, mm -hmm. 
that um, produced that piece mm. of work. It was a report to the Club of Rome, mm. um, which is sort of a, a, a global group of mm. people interested um, in the um, in the future mm. of the of the planet. And um, and and one of the main thrusts of that argument is that we need a new economic story, a new economic narrative, mm. um, one that is um, is not premised on, on growth and, and consumption, but is very much about a regenerative um, an economy. I read that book on my holiday um, <laughs> and, um, on a campsite in France. Um, it was very engaging um, and accessible. And uh, what I what I like about it, there's a particular metaphor that stays in mind, actually. Um, they talk about the progress that, that needs to be made and is being made as a ladder sort of emerging from um, the, the pit of where we are now to, um, and that um, that some people are still on the bottom rung of that ladder but, but progress has been made um, you know in sort of small incremental steps and others are aspiring to and slightly up that ladder and they they sort of draw attention to the fact that sometimes there's the tendency to despise the progress that's already being made to sort of push down those on the bottom rung of the ladder as if it's not enough and, and yes there is more to be done but actually the progress that business is making the um, you know, shifts that are happening around thinking about the circular economy and how we're starting to bring those sort of ideas into policies and business practices. Um, they are there, they're important, and they are there to be um, built upon. It's that idea of you know, working together um, and playing our part in the system towards this idea of a regenerative, regenerative economy where the economy is not seen as an end in itself, um, but actually as a means of encouraging life. Great, fantastic. Yeah. And remind us the title of the yeah. book so we can um, all put it on yeah. our holiday reading list. Um, <laughs> a finer future, um, right. creating an economy in service to life. Brilliant, super. Now we had a, a question that came in earlier around what is the type of leadership needed for the 21st century and does it differ between the public and private sector? Mm. So it'd be interested in your views as someone who has worked in the, yes. the public sector in, yes. earlier in their career on, on that. I think um, the answer to that question depends on whether you look at it as an empirical question of is there currently a, a difference um, between public sector and private sector leaders or whether we ask the question uh, should there be um, a difference um, especially as we look towards future development needs. Now in, in terms of that as an empirical research question there's actually relatively little research on that and, and quite a lot of it is um, from the 80s, 90s, and they would draw attention, for example, to private sector leaders being more fixed on um, short-term um, goals, um, narrow measures of financial success, public sector leaders thinking slightly more long-term um, with a much more complex um, set of uh, stakeholders mm. to, to please. Um, private sector leaders um, having a greater appetite for risk-taking and innovation, public sector leaders um, being a little bit more um, apprehensive about doing that because of their account sense of accountability for public money. What I think is, is interesting when we start to think about those categories of short-term, long-term, um, financial measures of success, other measures of success, based on the sort of things that we've been talking about in this webinar, mm -hmm. I think those categories are starting to dissolve a little bit. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean we've been looking at the importance of um, business taking an interest in the long-term flourishing of society and ecosystems because that is good for long-term business success so we're starting to dissolve that difference between short-term and long-term thinking equally um you know the measure of success of businesses purely being about generation of as much financial capital for shareholders in as short a time as possible that sort of category is starting to disintegrate. We're recognizing the importance on, of the business in creating value for a much wider um, set of um, stakeholders um, and thinking about businesses' role in society. And again, then you start to see that, well, maybe public and private sector leaders need to have that sense of the wider system, mm -hmm. the role of um, any organization in its wider society um, and, um, and, and what needs to change there. Um, and then in terms of innovation and experimentation, um, 
I think that the challenges that we face as private and public sector mm. are increasingly recognised as what we would call wicked, wicked mm. challenges. They are complex challenges that are multifaceted. It's never going to be one single act of making a difference there. There aren't simple, elegant solutions. They are messy solutions that we need that would involve both public and private um, mm. and other civil society NGO actors and um, playing their part there. And all of us are engaged in this sort of complex system um, and therefore those skills of being able to see that system and working that system I think will be um, as relevant to public and private sector um, so yeah I, I think there may be maybe there are differences now maybe they are less than they were um, 10 20 years ago and going forward I think there will be increasingly less difference yeah absolutely and, and talking about the skills piece we're certainly seeing um, individuals from both private sector and public sector joining our mm. online courses, right. joining things like the Leadership Lab, these yes. webinars. That's so right. it's great That's to see right. people looking, looking broader. Can I, um, can, I, can I comment on that? Mm. So I'm also seeing this convergence as you've described mm. it, but I'm also seeing another C word, which is the need to collaborate between those two yeah. stakeholder groups becoming much, much more apparent. There used to be a time uh, 10 years ago or so in business where you'd run a mile from uh, either policy makers, legislators, or indeed NGOs and charities in sort of this sort of sector. What we're now seeing is is not just collaboration, but alliances actually mm -hmm. uh, between sectors. So we at GVC do a lot of work, particularly in uh, one of our great um, sort of flagship programs is Advancing Net Zero, mm -hmm. um, which we've been working on for the last year. So it, that, that whole campaign has been given a great boost recently, obviously with the announcement of uh, the UK going net zero by 2050. Uh, but what that's requiring is is actually the whole industry coming together with policymakers. So Bayes mm. are a very as a department of uh, energy are very interested in the work that the industry is co-creating. And what does net zero really mean in the building sector? Mm -hmm. So that's an example of an yeah. alliance actually that's really healthy yeah. as well. Yeah. And equally, you're starting to see some big big brands now mm. collaborating very actively, very publicly mm. with with NGOs that you know they would be scared of many many years mm. ago. But now they're sort of, I won't name names, but you'll probably be able to work this out for yourself, but they're now co-creating advertising campaigns um, that, you know, that, that are viral hits on social media. Um, so I think that's, we're in very changing times. And that operating context and the sense of urgency, be it from a business lens or be it from a legislative lens, but probably underpinned by a huge public outcry, whether it be plastics, fast fashion, human rights, there's so many now tipping points being reached where actually the, both of those stakeholder groups are, are recognizing the urgency and a changing operating context of having to work together, being yes. forced together to work. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So about collaboration, co-creation, and as you said, you know, those stakeholders, but also social entrepreneurs, mm. individuals mm. that mm. make a massive difference. So we see this, for example, with the, the Unilever Young Entrepreneurs Awards. Yeah. I mean, there is inspiration mm and great experimentation and innovation coming from all over. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've got time for a few more questions. Um, and seeing as we have you in the room, Manish, we have had a question from the webinar, which is um, specifically on, on Plan A, which you've re referred to a few times. And the, the question is, how did m and deal with naysayers? I, I guess to flip that round, how did you encourage sort of broader um, sort of interest and involvement so i think i've spoken about the levers of change and, and and understanding that you know sustainable very traditional and very obvious sustainable levers aren't a language that everyone recognizes and everyone is motivated by so i won't repeat those but that is a is a very big tactic in, in trying to engage people that are not as engaged i think also recognition i think recognition is such an underplayed thing um, and i remember i recall at plan a we won over 200 awards and then, you know, we didn't make a huge public deal out of them, but we certainly did internally. We really celebrated those. Um, and I remember uh, being awarded, uh, being part of the team that were awarded Responsible Business of the Year by the BITC, mm. which is a tremendous accolade. But remembering a little bit cheesily, but very effectively, being forced to hold the trophy in my hands mm. and being told that this is partly because of your contribution. Mm. And actually, there were others that were probably not as converted as I was who hadn't played as big a role but were also holding the trophy and suddenly when you start this seeing this sort of public recognition you start seeing this sort of thing emerge and 200 awards there's nothing more motivating even if you don't really believe it 
than actually being recognised. Mm -hmm. and, and it goes back to the point, Louise, I think you made about sometimes you have to appeal to the ego mm -hmm. to try and make this happen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and certainly an award is, there's nothing more egoistic than <laughs> receiving an award, is there? And also, uh, just flipping the coin, I remember holding Plan A awards for our supply chain. Um, and I remember a CEO had built our greenest, biggest ever store being given Plan A Supplier of the Year. And as he came out off in tears, you know, this is a macho property person, came off in tears and said, this is the greatest moment of my professional career. Mm -hmm. This is worth more to me than winning my next, uh, I think he was a bit taken by the moment, he said, <laughs> um, than my next contract that I might win with MS or the birth of my child, which I did find a little bit strange. But I suppose he was so emotional at the recognition yeah. and the award that everything else didn't matter. And I yeah. think that's very powerful. Yeah, so it sounds like obviously the recognition piece, but also think, thinking about the broader ecosystem in terms of whether it's suppliers, whether yes. it's communities, yeah. employees, customers, systems, it's it's in terms of how you get, uh, a, it, how you actually get it embedded. So we've had a, a question from the webinar on that point around embedding, actually, because mm -hmm. um, obviously that's the holy grail in terms of how do you embed purpose, how do you embed responsible leadership, high impact leadership, so it is sort of business as usual. And we have the questioner, is the collaboration between leaders and followers more important during um, an embedding period of change? And Lou, mm -hmm. I just wondered if you had mm -hmm. any thoughts on that specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm not sure whether the questioner had in, what what the questioner had in mind in terms of more important than what, um, yeah. but um, but a couple of reflections. Mm. Um, one would be that recognizing the agency of followers introduces um, a little bit of risk into the whole program pro process of embedding change because as you recognize that. And, and want to encourage people to have their own agency mm -hmm. and ownership of a project, that necessarily means that they might then um, you push for something different or not stay on course, um, and, and, and that could, I guess, um, derail a, um, a project. Um, I, I find that a reflection from uh, two authors that I mentioned um, earlier, now I might not be able to pronounce his name right, but um, Guglielmo and um, Paul Suli, um, they talk about um, leadership within an organisation needing to be about less a sort of general command and control and more about a, um, a, a like a mayor managing diverse um, constituencies and I think that that role probably comes into play when it uh, um, when you start to embed change that you're constantly trying to um, encourage agency and ownership amongst um, a, a wide range of people whilst um, keeping people committed to the overall um, vision and um, and desired goals and um, so that the idea of um, having that shared goal in mind but with the right amount of freedom to allow people to pick that up and run with it and, and, and pursue that and I think that in order you know, any sort of embedding change to come back to your point earlier is about people really internalizing that um, that new story um, that new sense of where you're going um, and, and then there being the freedom to kind of act on that and maybe even push for more ambitious change um, over, the, over the future and achieve more than, than was ever intended. Um, I don't know if you have any reflections on that. Maybe. Yeah, so, so I was involved in um, four generations of Plan A at Marks and Spencer and, and, and every time I noticed that how the um, the reach of the sort of stakeholders we wanted to consult got bigger and bigger. And actually at the end, the, the last one I was involved with, we actually spoke to you know almost every colleague. Uh, and I know also with Unilever, their sustainable living plan, they've certainly adopted the same approach as well about it being a much more consultative, collaborative approach to creating sustainability strategy in this case, but any strategy. Brilliant, thank you, Manish. On that point, actually, we're, I think we're gonna to have to close the webinar. So just a quick look at what's coming up. So our next webinar, as I mentioned earlier, is on purposeful leadership, which will be held on the 12th of September. And other things to look forward to, the next cohort of the High Impact Leadership online course kicks off on the 31st of July. And we've got Leadership Lab from the 15th to the 16th of October. So thank you all very much indeed for joining us today. And my particular thanks to Lou and Manish. Um, super, super session. So thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.